I'm Tommy Salmons. This is Year Zero. Yesterday, I had this brilliant idea to invite somebody who is more knowledgeable on the Constitution and these historical laws that are being invoked. So I got a hold of Mr. Mike Meharry and we got on the phone this morning. So we are going to discuss the Pro Defense Production Act and all kinds of nastiness that we're seeing going on in society by the government today. Mike, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Oh, no doubt, man. So uh, last week, Trump invoked this Defense Production Act. Um, I had never even heard of that prior to uh, somebody, a friend of mine getting in touch with me and saying, hey, man, have you read this? And I, I looked through the Wikipedia. I hadn't really looked really in detail, but it said it's been invoked 50 other times. Um, when else has this been invoked? I don't know the answer to that question, to be honest with you. I was rather ignorant on the existence of this law as well. You know, it's interesting because when Trump declared a state of emergency, uh, which I guess has been about two or three weeks ago now, mm -hmm. this gave him all kinds of various powers under a whole bunch of congressional acts that have been passed over the year. I think there's over 135 powers. Uh, and like I said, they come through all of these various laws. I, I'm not sure that anybody can really, uh, you know, run down everything that the uh, Congress has empowered the president to do in a so-called emergency. Uh, so the War Powers Act is just one of many uh, possible things. I mean, from what I understand, uh, he could shut down radio stations. Uh, you know, there's just all of these weird powers that have been uh, passed over to the executive in the times of time of an emergency, and we're under an emergency emergency now, so he can pick and choose what he wants to initiate. Now, the this Production Act uh, apparently essentially allows the government to commandeer private industry uh, in order to make things that are necessary to fight the uh, coronavirus. So, uh, in this case, it would be things like respirators or maybe surgical masks or, or whatever. Um, it was originally passed as a wartime measure uh, to allow the federal government to commandeer private businesses to produce war material uh, you know, in the event of an actual war. So now apparently fighting a disease is a war. And it just goes to show how these powers tend to expand over time. Once, once that foot is in the door, once it's established that you know, the president or Congress can do X uh, in Y situation, pretty soon X is going to be done in Y and Z situation, and Y and A, you know. Right. And, and that's where we are today. It's ever expanding. It's like Robert Higgs explained in his uh, fantastic work, Crisis and Leviathan. Uh, government power always expands in an emergency. And it never goes back to the uh, where it was before. It's a ratchet effect, and it you know it might come down a little bit once the emergency is over, but some of those powers will remain. And uh, what we see over time is ever increasing government control over our lives. Yeah, and what what I mentioned on the last podcast I did with uh, or or the podcast before with with my trucking buddy Gord was that I worry about them involving themselves in the distribution chain yeah. and and really you know we we're going to see a planned chaos situation as mises would have put it so because here in the rural area of texas that i live in our grocery store is fully stocked people aren't really panicking it's kind of life is normal around here we're we're taking measures you know social distancing you know type stuff which is i guess the buzzword of the day right and uh we're you know we're we're taking measures such as that like i was just at a, a lumber store a while ago and they're only allowing 10 customers in at a time it's a small hardware store lumber store so they right. don't want 10 customers in the store at any given time okay that's fine and they they have the uh, entrance and exit dedicated now that's not just walk in either door mm -hmm. you know it's stuff like that so they're taking we're taking measures but people are working people are operating all our shelves are, are stocked and as a truck driver I look at it and I say yeah but what's going to happen when they start you know averting diverting all of this truck traffic whereas 
you know, the market basket down the road from me, the little small grocery store, might get one truck a week here. And But what if they stop getting that one truck a week? Mm-hmm. Now you got a, a situation where you're getting a shortage in an er, in an area that didn't have a previous shortage. So you're, you're creating more trouble than than you had in the beginning. So you, yeah. it's, it's going to be like a self-licking ice cream cone. You know? <laughs> yeah, you know, I was thinking about this. Uh, actually, I wrote an article for Shift Gold, uh, gold broker that Peter Schiff owns. And uh, I, I brought this, I, uh, this aspect up. And, you know, Frederick Bastiat, uh, people might be familiar with this famous essay, What is Seen and What is Unseen. He explains the difference between a good economist and a bad economist. Mm-hmm. A good economist looks at what is seen and what is unseen. He, he, he looks at the good possible ramifications that will be noticeable of a given policy, but he also seeks to figure out, okay, what are the possible unforeseen consequences of this policy? Bad economists don't do that. And the sad fact of the matter is most politicians are bad economists. They are not considering all of the alternatives here. They're just making decisions willy-nilly. And, you know, people have to understand, I'm I'm not one of these people that thinks that the coronavirus is, quote, just the flu. I, I think there is a serious health care uh, problem that is going on and i think there are things that need to be done to address it and i think it's interesting that you mentioned the fact that a lot of these things are being done voluntarily in your small community the whole idea of social distancing and 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 these types of things but what we're getting from government is a hammer and that hammer could conceivably crush the economy in fact i think that a lot of the measures that are being taken in terms of stimulus both from the government and the central bank are ultimately going to wreck the economy no matter what happens with coronavirus. And the problem is they're not considering the entire spectrum of economic consequences. They're not balancing the, uh, the, the bad with the good. They're just going forward. And, you know, the economy is life-sustaining. Uh, if you run the economy, it will kill people down the road. People have to work. People have to make a living. We have to have shelves stocked. And, you know, I don't want to sound over dramatic, but it is true that killing the economy will kill people on the margins. Yeah. And we have to consider that the cure that government may be instituting could be worse than the virus itself. But the problem is politicians aren't good decision makers. Politicians make decisions based on political calculation. They're looking, how can I make sure that I get reelected? How can I make sure that I don't do something that you know is going to make me look bad? And how can I make myself look the best and and usually that's by quote unquote doing something even if that something is stupid in the long run so i think this is you know i think the cure is going to be worse than the virus to be honest with you that's that's my personal opinion absolutely and that's 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 what i've been you know my my hackles have been raised on that you know since day one i'm like you know right now when it first happened i was like okay it's it's you know, it's like SARS or MERS or something like that. Right. Like, we've seen all this stuff happen before, you know. So, like, let's, why are we panicking? Let's not freak right. out, you know. And I think that, and I still to this day think that the hysteria is going to be worse than than the virus itself. And mm-hmm. not to say the virus isn't bad. And, you know, what I've read, there's, there's it, it's, it's really attacking elderly uh, people and right. you know, having a grandma that just died in January of pneumonia. I understand the mm-hmm. heartache and how hard it is watching a loved one go through that. But at the same time, I'm like, yeah, but if, if people, if, if people aren't dying of coronavirus and instead dying of starvation, is that better? Right. You know, like, yeah. And and so, you know, this, this kind of brings us to the constitutional issue that, that, you raised at the very beginning. This is why we have a constitution. This is why there are limits on government power. It was meant to put up a fence so that when there's a panic, everybody knows that politicians are going to go and try to do everything in the world. The constitution creates a fence. It says like, whoa, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and and decision making, you know, in, in the U.S. system, if we actually followed the constitutional system as it was created, it devolves decision making down to the state and local level, which I think is a better, uh, you know, 
better decision making thing. What's happening in New York right now is is significantly more uh, of a of a crisis in the healthcare system than what's happening here in my county in Florida, where there's been one reported case. Mm-hmm. Uh, so obviously the reactions should be different, but what we're going to end up with is one size fits all actions imposed by Washington D.C. Uh, that aren't going to be suitable for a rural area in Texas or uh, you know Wyoming, uh, and you're going to, like I said, you're you, it's whenever you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, is the old saying, and and that's exactly what we're seeing right now. The federal government is a hammer, and it sees everything as a nail, and there's no. Uh, no discernment and there's no subtlety involved in the decision making processes uh virtually everything that the federal government is proposing to do uh is not authorized by the constitution and people will say to me well mike this is an emergency the federal government must do something i don't see anything in the constitution that says that the limits on federal power are uh, just wiped away simply because somebody decides there's there's an emergency uh, it's not authorized, and it shouldn't be done. Uh, the states have a great deal of latitude, and the states should respond. Now, the state responses pretty much suck too, mm. but you know, at least at least there's some some uh, some legal justification for the actions that governors are taking, as opposed to what Donald Trump and and the Congress critters are doing. Yeah, absolutely, and you know, I, I've seen some people calling for, you know the military to be mobilized and and things like that and i'm really concerned um i you know i i use that saying you know when when the only tool you have is a hammer every problem looks like a nail because i've yet to see a situation in which um the military has nation built successful (laughs) you know and i i'm like i don't know if that's what we want if we want that kind of interaction happening on the streets of our cities you know yeah. and i have a i have a buddy of mine uh that was in the navy during the the haiti disaster the earthquake in haiti oh yeah he was uh he was sent there on a relief mission and to hear the horror stories of of how the navy was acting towards the civilian population yeah. it's i don't want that for anybody you know right and yeah and so and he was a, he was a, I think he was a petty chief or a master chief at the time. I can't remember. He's retired now, but he uh, he told me he said I had to like almost go fist to cuffs with people over giving the citizens, the civilian population that was suffering, water because yeah. the the soldiers were trying to hoard all the water and not give it out to the people that were in need and that we were there to help. Yeah. And I was, you know, and I, and that's what I look at and I'm like, man, I don't know if this is necessarily the best thing. Yeah, back in my neocon days, I used to listen to Rush Limbaugh and uh, you know, not really a big Rush Limbaugh fan anymore, but there were some nuggets of truth and the man was good at turning a phrase. And he used to talk about the military and, and he would say that its purpose is to break people, break things and kill people. Mhm. I'm not sure that we want an institution that's purpose is to break things and kill people, uh, you know, set loose on the the streets of the United States to, quote unquote, save us from from coronavirus. Again, another example of the uh, the cure being worse than the actual virus. And again, what are the constitutional uh, justifications for turning the U.S. military loose uh, because there's a virus? There isn't any. Um, but again, you know, we're at a point now where people just uh, they have completely lost their minds and those fences are being torn down. And I think what people need to remember is when you tear down that fence, it ain't going to get built back again. So all of these precedents that, that are being set and uh, that are probably going to be set uh, are going to mean further erosions of our liberty down the road. And, you know, it, it's it's easy to say, well, we have to do anything and everything to combat a virus. Uh, but, you know bad economist we need to look at what is unseen as well and what is unseen is what you know is down the road in a year or two years when the federal government is still you know how far are we out from 9-11 and we're still laboring under you know spying on everybody in the world under the patriot act Um, that should be a warning sign for us that i'm i'm afraid people simply won't heed right 
And one of the things that you've been doing here recently that I think that that is really important is you've been releasing these um, these short videos discussing what's happening with the economy and the Fed pumping out all this money. And I saw, um, I think it was PBS had released uh, an article two days ago saying that they were going to be injecting a trillion dollars a day into the economy. Yeah, it's insane. What 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 are we looking at here? Are we looking at the the total collapse of the dollar, or is there any way they're going to be able to save this economy if they continue to do this? Well, you know, I'm I'm very reluctant to prognosticate <laughs> uh, because the you know the economy is such a complex thing, and there are so many factors that that can fit into an equation. So it's hard to see everything. Mm -hmm. But in 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 my view. I think the macroeconomic picture is pretty bleak. If you just look at what's happening, you're absolutely right. The Federal Reserve right now is injecting trillions of dollars into the economy. And when we say injecting trillions of dollars, what we really mean is it's creating money out of thin air. That's the bottom line. And it does it through various mechanizations. It does it through artificially suppressing interest rates. It does it through quantitative easing, which is simply uh, the Federal Reserve buying up U.S. government bonds, effectively monetizing the debt, and then that money goes out into the economy. So we are pumping all of these dollars into the world system. Now, what's happening right now is the dollar is actually getting stronger because we're seeing a stock market crash. People are selling off everything. People are hiding in dollars because that, you know, that's the safest thing you can be in is cash, right? Mm -hmm. But I think down the road, you are going to start seeing a a rapid devaluation of the dollar, a rapid increase in inflation, uh, and, and possibly, not to be alarmist, even hyperinflation. Because, you know, this is the perfect storm because we we not only have all of this money pumping into the system, and of course they did this in 2008. This is the, the playbook that the Federal Reserve has. It's a one-trick pony. It's Keynesian economics. Whenever there's a downturn, we pump money into the system, and then we have government stimulus on top of it. We, we throw dollars at everybody. Yeah. It worked in 2008 for two reasons. Number one, people thought it was temporary. They thought, well, it's, you know, they'll, they'll put this money in the system, but eventually they'll soak it back up. Well, they tried to do that in 20, uh, 2018, and the stock market started to crash. So you know, people need to remember that they went back to easy monetary policy before the coronavirus thing happened. The economy was underlying – the underlying economy was weak even before this happened. Now we're pumping even more money into the system. And we have a situation where virtually everybody's sitting at home doing nothing. That means things are not getting produced. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have more dollars chasing fewer goods. That is the definition of price inflation. I don't see how you avoid a dollar collapse at this point. Now, I could be wrong. You know, I, I wouldn't go out and make investment decisions based on what Mike Meharry says. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of economists a lot smarter than I that think the same thing. Now, there are other ones that think, oh, yeah, the Fed will be able to pump up the bubble again. But I think uh, economic realities catch up with that at some point. And, and I do see them per precipitating a, a dollar crisis. Uh, I, I think we're going to end up with an inflationary recession or a depression, which, uh, you know, stagflation like the 70s, where you have increasing prices and uh, and low economic activity. And it's going to be ugly, I think, uglier than the coronavirus. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you there. Um, I, I wish I was a little bit more versed in economics. I know just enough to uh, talk an idiot down off the cliff. <laughs> But right. uh, but I had, I'm not I'm not going to write any books on it anytime soon. I promise you. Um, so when it, whenever you said that it's 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 generally basically they're doing the exact same thing they were doing in 2008. I don't know for from my perspective, it seems like it's actually more than what they did in 2008. Am I am, did I miss something in 2008? I wasn't near as active in paying attention to what was going on. So were they doing as much? In as far as the printing and the injecting money into the system uh, in 2008 as they are now? or, or are Well, yes and no. It, it is happening much faster okay. this time. Uh, I, I can give you some inter interest rate perspective <coughs> that I happen to know off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at when, when the crash started in 2008, when people started getting, getting concerned, the interest rate was actually at about 5%, which isn't particularly high. 
uh, but you know, much higher than where we were when this started. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, from from there, it took about a year and a couple of months to go from that level down to zero. Mm -hmm. We went from the level that it was when coronavirus started, which was I. Uh, I think it was 1.25. So we were at 1.25, which is lower than five, if you haven't noticed. Hmm. We went from there to zero in two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> so this is happening on a much faster scale. But like I said, the, the loose monetary policy actually started long before the coronavirus thing hit. So uh, I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but I think I can sum it up relatively quickly. In hmm. 2008, we went to zero. They launched three rounds of quantitative easing. Uh, in effect, pumping money into the system. Most of that money ended up going into the stock market. That's why we've seen these record stock market levels. Mm -hmm. uh, it created a fake wealth effect. People felt like they had more. It pumped up a new housing bubble. It'll, you know, this easy money, low interest rates allow people to borrow. So we're at a situation now where people are way over leveraged. We have trillions American. Uh, consumers have over $1 trillion in credit card debt right now. 60% mm -hmm. uh, of American corporations have uh, their bonds are rated just one step above junk. So, you know, we're, we have nearly 60% that are in precarious financial situations when it comes to corporations. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we all know about the government debt. We're, we're running trillion dollar deficits before this even started to happen. Yeah. In 28, uh, the, the Federal Reserve began to try to normalize. So they did all of this activity in 2008. Took them all the way to 2016 before they even started to attempt to normalize. Raised interest rates just a tad. Uh, they really started in earnest in 2018 to try to raise interest rates. And they, they raised interest rates, I think, three or four times in 2018. They started to shrink the balance sheet. In other words, start to soak up that liquidity that's out there, try to bring the dollars back into the Fed. And if you recall, in December of or fall of 2018, the stock market started to crash. And the response was to stop raising interest rates. They stopped shrinking the balance sheet. And then last year, we had three interest rate cuts. So we had three rate cuts before coronavirus. So that's what I'm saying, that we were actually – the bubble was starting to deflate before coronavirus hit. Mm -hmm. Coronavirus is the pin that has absolutely popped that bubble now. I don't think there's any reinflating it at this point because this is not just a coronavirus – created economic problem this is an economic problem that was that was in existence because of past actions from the government and the federal reserve it's the natural business cycle it was just waiting for the pin to prick it coronavirus is that pin uh you know and and here we are within two weeks we've lost like 30 percent of the stock market the stock market is now below where it was when uh, Trump took office. So all of the gains that we've seen in the Trump presidency are, have vanished in just two weeks. Right. I, I talked to somebody um, just last week that told me that that both um, her and her husband both lost over a thousand, a hundred thousand uh, dollars in a, in in like six or seven days. Yeah. Yeah. So so it's it's bad. And and yeah, I I I think people. I don't know. I guess people just don't pay attention to what's going on because I, I've I, I see a lot of people saying that this re the, the recession that we're entering into and, uh, you know, is is caused by the coronavirus. And, and I'm trying to explain to them. No, 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 no. There was no coronavirus in August when they were pumping trillions of dollars <laughs> right. into the economy. This, yeah, in, se in, se in September, when they started the repo operations to try to artificially suppress the overnight lending market, which was showing that there was, uh, you know, structural cracks in the financial system. All of this happened long before coronavirus. Right, right. This is this has been a problem. And okay, so from a libertarian perspective, I'm trying to wrap my mind around the the idea of whether or not I should be that concerned about the economy because for years you know you listen to bob murphy you listen to tom woods you listen to these guys and they say what we need to do is just allow it to deflate completely and and get a, a nice steady recovery after the the pain comes and goes right. but so part of me is like yes like just get rid of these bubbles altogether. 
But the other part of me is, well, they're gonna once these bubbles completely deflate, they're just gonna create more. You see what I'm saying? Because they're not gonna stop intervening in the economy. No. <laughs> so it, it's kind of one of those catch twenty twos. You can't win for losing in this situation. Yeah, I, I think for me, you know what? What my family, what we're trying to do is we're trying to shield ourselves as much as possible from the impacts mm. of all of this government intervention you know no matter how it plays out there's only two options the, the one option is they manage to reinflate this bubble again with that that this quantitative easing works which is only going to set up the next big crash um you know that's that's one alternative i think the more likely alternative is eventually they put so much uh, money into the system that the dollar collapses um, and, and at that point, you know, we could see some radical changes in, in the global economy. The dollar could very easily uh, become the uh, not reserve currency anymore. You know, I mean, we could see some major things. All, all we can do, I think, as individuals is, is be prepared as best we can, you know, mm-hmm. um, have alternative currencies, gold, silver, crypto, um, you know, be prepared to have shortages of food, have shortages of supplies, uh, all of those type of things. Be prepared for social unrest. Know how you're going to defend yourself. Uh, you know, I've never been a prepper. I'm turning into a prepper because I don't think that the economy is sustainable. And so, you know, and I, I know the government's not going to save me. So, you know. We have to be uh, we have to be prepared for ourselves, and and that's what we're trying to do. And uh, you know, meanwhile, I'll keep sending up the warning flags of, of what the government's doing, but I, I don't think I can stop it. Yeah, I mean, we're not going to be able to stop it. All, all we can do is is let people know, you know, give people the best information possible. And I'm with you. Um, I'm not. I wouldn't say I'm turning into a prepper. I'm a, I'm a country boy by nature, so, so you're, you're a prep. You're a prepper by uh, by. I'm, by your I'm a de facto anyway. prepper. I, I yeah. mean, I live on nine acres. I have a pond that's stocked with fish. I have, yeah. you know, we we have vegetables that we have planted. You know, right. things of that nature. So we're we're going to be okay. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So I, I we have some cash on hand if needed, and that's one thing I did want to bring up with you. Uh, did you have you noticed um banks turning people away because i had a friend tell me the other day that the banks turned him away and wouldn't let him withdraw money oh i I have not heard that um i wouldn't be surprised if you don't see some of that kind of sporadic activity um you know that's the nature of the beast i would Mm -hmm. suggest if if that happens use your atm and pull out a couple hundred dollars a day you know um and, and build up those reserves I, I, my thought is is I think you should have at least two thousand dollars cash on hand, um, and then you know if possible also some silver because silver is a is a good barter metal if things really go crazy. But um, I haven't heard that yet. But you know it certainly wouldn't be a surprise. I mean everything else is in short supply because people are in panic mode. Yeah, well I mean and if you're if you're last minute minute buying silver and I I have to be honest I do not have any precious metals on hand um just i uh keep ammunition on hand but no precious well, metals um but I mean, ammunition will certainly would certainly be a a, a barter tool as well right there's no doubt that ammunition ammunition and alcohol <laughs> yeah exactly well yeah and, I, and cigarettes and i'm not trying to be funny i mean if you you know you look at what has turned into currency during major crises yeah, that those are the things right ammunition alcohol and and cigarettes yeah no people uh, don't like to give up their vices right and well and what i was going to say is i saw the other day that the premium on physical silver was uh, at 50 percent yeah i believe it i i i do work for shift gold i know for a fact that they are only taking certain quantity orders like you have to be above a certain quantity before they'll even take can't keep up with the demand right uh and and, you know it's interesting because precious metals the price is actually pretty low right now which also happened in 2008 uh people don't realize this but in in uh the seven months of uh between march and the end of 2008 gold actually dropped about 26 percent people people liquidate their gold when there's a crisis in order to cover margins and and you know try to try to stem the bleeding from their stock losses uh but after that 
gold went up 106 percent between 2009 and 2011 and silver actually went up 400 plus percent in that same time period so uh, you know just kind of a, a picture of what's probably ahead in terms of precious metals yeah yeah and you know i mean even even with a 50 percent premium i mean are you looking you're probably looking at a situation where it's probably worth the investment at this point in time to have the physical silver on hand rather than a paper contract right yeah, and I think there are probably brokers where you're going to get a, a more reasonable premium, I think. You know, not to get into precious metals buying, but you definitely want to check out reputable, well-established firms. Um, I, you know, Obviously, I'm going to recommend Shift Gold because that's who I work for, but there are others out there. Oh, come on. <laughs> Full running, disclaimer. Are we going to turn this into an infomercial? Oh, we could. <laughs> buy, buy silver, you know. We, Chip Gold doesn't do infomercials. Yeah, so. I know, I know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I actually have a lot of, I have a lot of respect for uh, Peter Schiff. I, 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 yeah. can't, I can't always keep up with, with his train of thought, but I have a lot of respect for the man. <laughs> yeah, well, I've learned, you know, that's pretty much what I do with Shift Gold is, is I, uh, I try to distill his 45-minute podcast into, you know, a 600 or 700 word article so <laughs> i've gotten pretty good at it yeah yeah i know i read the one i read the one that uh that you wrote last week uh yeah it was it was really interesting i was like huh, interesting um so with the with the all right so with america living on so much credit you you had brought up the credit earlier and mm-hmm. and, and how it, this is is going to be are we looking at taking a serious um hit to our standard of living i you know people go around saying well the united states is the richest country in the world i'm like it's the richest country per standard of living but if right. you if you look at the debt that corporations have that the federal government has that each and every state and local uh government has is running up that what people how people are living beyond their means you're you're looking at uh, a perfect storm in my in my you know estimation and that the credit that we've been gotten so comfortable and dependent on is actually going to be the vessel that actually destroys us yeah you know it's credit kicks the can down the road right i mean we all know this from our own personal experiences you know you you use the credit card you got to pay that credit card bill at some point Mm -hmm. uh uh, national debt, corporate debt, is no different. It has to be paid down the road, whether uh, it's through taxation or more often through inflation. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think that there, there's only a certain amount of debt that can be sustained before it really starts to erode uh, the the uh, prosperity and the and the economic growth. I've seen studies that show that when the national debt reaches 106 percent. Or, <clears throat> I'm sorry, when the national debt hits 90% of GDP, that it starts to retard economic growth at about a rate of about 30%. And even before the coronavirus crisis, we were at about 106% debt to GDP ratio when you consider all of the obligations that the government has. Uh, that's going to soar. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're not collecting taxes, nobody's working, and the federal government is fixing to spend. Uh, you know, trillions of dollars. So the the debt is about to even skyrocket even more. And, you know, that's the issue that the central bankers face right now. Um, low interest rates are necessary to sustain debt. You know, if you start raising interest rates, that raises the debt payments. Um, so that's part of the reason you see this desperate attempt to keep interest rates low. Well, what happens when you start having inflationary pressure, which we've already discussed is coming? Mm-hmm. The response to that is to interest rates rise when inflation starts. That's that's the cure for inflation, you know, higher interest rates. But you can't raise interest rates because there's so much debt. So you're left with two choices. You're either going to crush everybody by raising interest rates and and everybody's going to default, or you're going to try to keep interest rates artificially suppressed and inflation is going to get out of control. There's really no there's really no good scenario here. Um, you know when it when it comes to the economy, and when all of this happens, unfortunately, what you're going to find is is a bunch of lefties are going to blame capitalism, yeah. <laughs> which none of this has anything to do with capitalism whatsoever. But that's the ugly political world that we live in. So, well, I mean, I I kind of 
what the way I look at it is 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 the prescription and 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 the the way that they define capitalism is exactly what the United States is, and right. they, they don't define the free market as capitalist. Exactly. So I distinguish whenever they say capitalism, I'm like, yeah, I agree with you. Like the system as is 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 a yeah. total shit show. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So so let's get the government out of it. You know, let's just get rid of you know, completely decentralize not only the the economy but the monetary system as well. You know, yeah. like Hayek always talked about having multiple currencies. You know, competing against each other. Right. You know, and and that's that's probably. You know, with with the rise of cryptocurrencies and like you said, with the devaluation of the dollar, almost certainly coming in the future, you're you're looking at a situation where you may have a more um, competitive currency market, which which is a good thing. But the pain that our children or uh, our, our and our grandchildren are going to feel in that transition period right. is going to suck royally, you yeah. know? And so that's that's part of what the libertarian view has been saying is like, let's just get this over with. Yeah. You know, I don't want, the longer we put this off, the worse it's going to be, you know, yeah. whenever like, it does collapse on us. You know, like I said, the, I, maybe I didn't say this, maybe it just went through my head, but, you know, you can kick, you can kick the can down the road for so long, but eventually you run out of road. And, uh, right, right, no, and, and and we we need a cleansing. We're going to have a cleansing, one way or the other. Uh, and, and if people can recognize that we're going to have to go through some sacrifice and pain, uh, then you know we'll be better off for it down the end of the road. But unfortunately, you know the government want. It's funny because you listen to Trump; he's talking about sacrifice. You know, we need to sacrifice. We're going to fight this virus, and yet. They don't want there to be any pain. That's why they're going to send you know checks to everybody, and they're going to bail out the airlines, and they're going to bail out the movie theaters, and they're going to bail out everybody. It's bailout nation. Right. Um, what we're trying to have is sacrifice without pain. It doesn't work that way. And the attempts to eliminate that pain by you know sending everybody a check or bailing out everything in the world, that's going to simply exacerbate the problem. It's throwing gasoline on the fire. It's going to uh, light the inflation up into a bonfire like we've never seen before. Yeah. Um, but, you know, again, I, I feel like I'm spitting into the wind in, in a lot of ways because people <laughs> just, they just don't get it. And we are making decisions based on panic right now. And, you know, if, if we still had some of those constitutional uh, limits on government in place, you know, some of this would be stopped. And that's, you know, that goes back to the importance of uh, adhering to those those principles. But well, yeah. And I mean, somebody I, I know somebody <coughs> just wrote a book on this. Um, yeah, I heard about that. I think it's called Con- Constitution Owner's Manual. Yeah. And, yeah, and if people like are interested in it, they can go to uh, Constitution Owner's Manual dot com. And, and <laughs> I check still that need out. to get a hold of that. i'm not uh you know as an anarchist i'm not like the biggest fan of the constitution but it never hurts to know the arguments you know for those people that are saying but the constitution okay well right (laughs) the constitution says we're not to fund a standing army for longer than two years so what are we going to do about that right exactly and and i think you know i i'm i'm an anarchist as well so it's a it's a constitution book written by an anarchist yes um but I think you're right. It is important, and it shows the failure of the system. Mm. And, you know, it, it, it is a legal document, so in some sense it could be used from a practical standpoint uh, to to at least rein in the behemoth a little bit if people would choose to do it. We do have we do have options within the system as it exists to roll back federal power using state nullification, using non-cooperation and whatnot. So I, I think there are some practical tools in the Constitution toolkit, even though ultimately, uh, you know, I don't I don't believe that uh, there, there's such thing as a social contract. So, Well, I mean, I think the social contract and the and those that are to adhere by the Constitution or those in public office or working for the government because they actually take an oath to the Constitution. You know exactly. What I'm so I'm I'm not I'm not against you know I, I'm not against the Constitution as far as well you took an oath of the Constitution so we're going to use it to keep you in check. I'm against the Constitution as in like well it it legitimizes eminent domain and that's a 
that's theft you know <laughs> so, right. you know things like that so but um what one of the things i've been thinking of and and it's because there's a lot of you know quote unquote conspiracy theory around this virus mm-hmm. and so i wanted i wanted to run this by you and see what you had to what you had to say about this because it's something i've been kicking around in my head so there's this there's this theory that the tariffs that trump put on china had created such economic you know strife for china that they intentionally released this virus right there are rumors that there were chinese uh, nationals in italy giving out free hugs and spreading the virus intentionally yada right. yada yada okay so i and i don't want to get off in those weeds but if if let's say just for instance this is uh the beginning of or the a major play in an economic war on behalf of china if china were to sell off all the american bonds back to america that they currently own which basically means they're collecting on the payment the debt that america right. owes them what what are we potentially looking at and is it uh, is that a potential threat coming up this year in the future well, as I understand it, you know the the Chinese they are the biggest international holder of U.S. debt. It used to be Japan, but right. but China is uh, the the biggest international holder. I believe that um, at least the last time it, I looked, and this has been months ago, but uh, the the domestic holdings of debt are bigger than what china has but nevertheless they own a significant amount of bonds they don't even have to sell all of it to create chaos in the bond market um you know bond bonds were supply and demand just like anything else right when the supply of bonds gets bigger the price of bonds drop Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's important to understand that there is an inverse relationship between the price of a bond and the interest rate on a bond. So as the price drops, the interest rate goes up to entice people to buy those bonds. If China were to dump, say, 30% of their bond holdings on the market, it would be a glut of bonds. It would push the price of bonds way down. It would push the interest rates way up. Uh, This would cause a significant problem, first off, for the federal government, because the federal government's having to sell all kinds of bonds new bonds into the marketplace in order to fund all of this debt right um so you would see basically a crash in the price of bonds and a huge spike in interest rates Uh, as we've already discussed interest rate rising is a big problem when you have a an economy that's built on a pile of debt Uh, so you can see just with just the ramifications of the economy if the chinese were to do that it would it would totally paralyze the financial markets now, from what I understand, there would also be consequences to the Chinese economy as well. So there is there is some risk in them doing this because there would be some blowback on them. You know, they do depend on the U.S. as as their uh, uh, source for their exports. Um, so it would take time for them to basically they'd have to turn their economy around to where more consumption in the country itself, et cetera, et cetera. It's not without risk for China to do this, but it is certainly a weapon. It's been called the nuclear option. And, and there was talk of the Chinese doing this even, you know, before all this coronavirus started mm-hmm. with the with the trade war. So right. uh, certainly serious ramifications. Um, and, and the whole saber rattling around this, uh, you know, because China China has accused the U.S. of creating the virus and mm-hmm. dumping it in China. So, you know, uh, wouldn't it be lovely to have World War Three on top of uh coronavirus oh absolutely and with with governments i wouldn't put it past them well and let me be the first to say how are we going to pay for it (laughs) (laughs) right right well we'll just print some more money no problem right we've got a printing press but uh okay see because like one of the things i was kicking around in my head is if china were to to sell american bonds and to just dump them i was thinking that it might cause a domino effect and then you would see Japan, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia follow suit. And that would just, to me, that would just devastate the entire world. Yeah. Well, and, and what you would see, you would, you know, it would precipitate a do- that dollar crisis. You would probably see uh, um, a 
currency war where different currencies vied for um you know dominance to become the world reserve co- currency and um who knows what would happen you know that's uh, that gets way well beyond my my ability to to foresee but again certainly a possibility that china would do something like that uh in in the last resort it would be a nuclear option uh but you know they don't have to dump all of them they can they can create havoc in in the u.s bond market simply by selling you know a small portion of the of what they hold so yeah yeah okay so yeah that like i said that's something i've been kicking around in my head i'm like if this is now i have my own theory on where this virus comes from okay See, what I think happened, but see, well, my theory got, got squashed the other day when Tulsi Gabbard dropped out of the race and endorsed Joe Biden. Because my, my theory was that, that Jeff Bezos teamed up with Vladimir Putin and hired Dr. Evil to create this virus, set it loose in China, and then spread it around the world in order to kill every presidential candidate over the age of 70 so that Tulsi <laughs> Gabbard was the only presidential candidate you know, still around. And as Hillary Clinton said, she's obviously a Russian agent, so she's going to be doing the bidding of Russia. And then everybody's forced to stay home, and Jeff Bezos gets rich and... and richer by the day because everybody has to order their products through amazon and vladimir putin is now ruling the world <laughs> right I, I guess with tulsi gabbard dropping out that's no longer a viable yeah option. no i i think uh, i think i think russia russia uh, meddling confirmed <laughs> yeah yeah, uh, you know, this is this is the kind of stuff i have time to think about whenever i'm making right. sure y'all have groceries in your store yeah, well, we appreciate that. Thank you for your service. <laughs> I should probably listen, be listening to to your audio book and not not be thinking of ridiculous scenarios. Yeah, you know, writing writing satire pieces. Right. Uh, <laughs> probably helped me out more in the long run. Well, we're at, we're we're at like forty five minutes now. I think I've covered everything. Um, I, what I really appreciate about about you is you have such a such a unique way of of breaking this down uh to layman's terms so people that can understand what's going on in the economy and and things of that nature so i really appreciate that what what are your last thoughts on um anything that that people should be watching for and what um what they should be you know worried about well i think at this point you know i I don't think we have a whole lot of control over uh what the government is going to do i think that um, you know, I, th- I think the wheels are in motion. I think a lot of this right now is just momentum. It's dominoes falling. I was talking to my wife the other day. You know, it seems like every day uh, the the pressure gets ratcheted up a little bit more. There's more, more and more restrictions. It's kind of like boiling a frog. You know, they're turning the water up a little bit at a time. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's anything that we can do to stop that right. at this point. It, it's got a momentum of its own. I would really encourage people to try to look past the news of the day and try to put things into broader perspective, both looking back and looking forward, you know, looking back and remembering that the economy was shaky long before coronavirus came along and that this isn't just a uh, uh, an economic blip on the radar because we've had a virus and everything's going to be fine when the virus is gone. That That's not the reality. Uh, to to look ahead and understand that a lot of the government policies that are being implemented now aren't going to go away. And to remember this moment that that's what caused it and maybe use that as a warning sign for the next time. Just to have a little bit broader perspective because we tend to forget what happened yesterday uh, and, you know, the the world of politics is a is a continuous uh, I guess a line, and we need to look at the whole line and not just what's happening today. Uh, you know, when when things go really bad, remember that the Federal Reserve pumped all this money into the system, and that's not capitalism. And so, you know, electing Bernie Sanders isn't going to solve the problem. I think those are the things that we really need to be focused now, particularly as libertarians, being that giving that consistent limited government message because i've even seen some libertarians starting to justify some of this government action yeah. uh, we have to hold to our principles because our principles will be vindicated in the end because 
all of this is going to have consequences, you know. You can't escape economics. You can't escape the, the laws of politics, which are basically that it's all about power and control. Uh, so I, that's, that, that would be my lasting words. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not hopeful in, in you know, stopping what's going on right now, but I think we can learn from it. And I think as libertarians, we have the tools to explain things in a broader picture and help people to see the reality of the situation, that it's not just – yeah, it's not just a virus. We need to look look bigger than that. Yeah, and and my wife brought it up to me, you know, like because I've I've been pretty laid back and calm during this whole situation, and just you know, I mean, I I'm as a trucker, I just got to keep on rolling. I gotta, yep. you know, I got to do what I got to do, and um, it, it's hard leaving her at home, you know, knowing what's going on. And she's like, "Well, you seem like you're you're a little panicked by this," and I'm like, "I'm not so panicked by the virus." I'm really not. I'm yeah. panicked by the the government response, response. Mm-hmm. and and by the way that people are are reacting. Yep. And, you know, and that that worries me more. I, I have five kids and they all live in Houston, and you know I'm texting them, telling them like, hey, you know, get out of the city if you can. Like you can come yeah. to my place. I got an extra room. Like we, or or go you know go up to the lake house. Go do what you got to do, but get out of the city, especially. My daughter, you know, who who had my my first granddaughter last October, I, I'm yeah. like, yeah, get. I don't want y'all in the middle of all this if it if it does boil over and yeah. into civil unrest or martial exactly. law or whatever, because the city's the worst place to be for yep. a situation like that. Yep. So you know, I'm not so worried about the virus. If I get sick and you know, I'm going to be a high risk um, just because I smoke, and if I get sick and um, I, you know, something happens, I'll, I'll deal with that as, you know, accordingly, but I'm, I'm really concerned about the reaction and and the overreaction. So I I think, I think your, I think your attitude in, in what you're doing is absolutely correct. Ultimately, what we need to do is we need to take care of our families and we need to take care of our neighbors. Yeah, you know, and and use this as a time to to bond together and help each other out, and, mm. and recognize that the government's not our friend. The government's not going to help us. We we are responsible for ourselves, uh, and, and taking the actions and taking care of the people in our lives. And and I think that could be the positive that comes out of this: building stronger, real communities instead of these right. stupid, uh, you know, political whatever right. so i think i think you're demonstrating the correct response to this look out for your family look out for yourself and 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 then look out for your community as best you can right and and uh, i heard somebody the other day say that you know this would be the perfect time if you haven't taken the time to do so to get out and meet your neighbors and get to yeah, know them absolutely you know and, and and everybody pull together and you know and help each other out you know and we don't need the government to tell us in a, in a time of crisis to to help each other out just look at like here in my area I, y'all have the same problem in florida which you haven't you just moved to florida so you haven't dealt with this on a major level but you know with the hurricanes you always see like the first people to show up here in in southeast texas are what they call the cajun navy which yep. is a bunch of bunch of damn coon asses in their boats you know <laughs> right. like, it's like they're just rolling around hey y'all need anything you you need yeah. you know you evacuating what you need and you know that's when when harvey hit here that's what i did i called my cousin who lives you know 45 minutes away in in a little town in louisiana and said hey uh i'm stuck in wyoming on on a load can you get to beatrix and and pick her up yeah. And, and they they came over we're not we're not asking the government to come take care of us you know what i'm saying yeah. and because they have a tendency to screw these things up <laughs> just it's, a little. it's just i would just like no just just stay away we got we got this you we know? got this yeah <laughs> you know so that that's kind of my my thing is just like yeah get to know your neighbors make sure that everybody's taken care of you know and you can do it on a voluntary basis you don't have to have the government coming in forcing you to do these things right you know exactly and yeah make sure your family's taken care of first get your household in order and then from that point then you start branching out a little bit at a time you know yep. and and you know we'll we'll all make it through this we'll all survive you know but yep. when we come out the other side America may not look like America anymore. It may not. Yeah. And, uh, you know, 
we'll just have to go forward. We control what we can t- control, and we uh, have to let the rest of it go. Yeah, absolutely. So let's plug everything we need to plug, man. All right. Visit 10th Amendment Center.com. We're doing the political stuff over there, trying to keep this uh, behemoth limited. Uh, would definitely appreciate your support over there. Uh, it's 10th, T E N T H Amendment Center.com, and that's where a lot of my work is done. Uh, you can go to my own website, michaelmeharry.com. Uh, you'll find the link to my books, uh, particularly my new one, Constitution Owner's Manual. You can also go to constitutionownersmanual.com to find specific information on the book. Uh, I've got it in paperback and Kindle right now, and the audiobook is in the process of being produced, so it should be out within the next 20 to 30 days. Um, if you're interested in following the economic ramifications uh, you can find my work on that over at shiftgold.com slash news. And uh, I do a couple of blog posts over there every day uh, and then link to a lot of what Peter Schiff is doing. So, um, you know, that's the place to get what's going on with the financial markets and all. And um, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. And you got a couple of podcasts, too. Godarchy. Oh, yeah. And- that's right. I, Godarchy.org. I forgot about Godarchy. <laughs> uh, Godarchy.org for, for folks who are, who are Christians. Uh, we talk about the uh, kind of the overlap between the uh, Christian theology and libertarian anarchism mm-hmm. and voluntarism. So that's over at godarchy.org. And uh, actually, uh, if people are interested in prepping and preparedness. I actually interviewed Suzanne Sherman on the last episode of the Godarchy podcast, oh, nice. and uh, we talked about you know what do you do if you if you you know you live in town and you've never even thought about prepping before you know don't be don't feel like it's hopeless you can start now and uh you know get prepared so right my mom loves that podcast that's why i wanted to make sure we got that out yeah i appreciate you i can't believe i forgot about that yeah. um yeah and then i do a podcast for shift gold as well which is over at shiftgold.com slash news awesome awesome okay well that was mike my i am tommy salmons late <laughs>